folks. We are having technical difficulties with our brand new software. Of course, it worked before, but now it's not working. So those folks uh, trying to join on uh, YouTube, there's a YouTube difficulty between the software and our meeting, but um, it is also available on Zoom. And I do notice that we have attendees on Zoom. So I will go ahead and call to order this meeting. And um, could we please have the roll call? Here. 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 Thank you for that. And then we will move on to our land acknowledgement. The city of Katati recognizes that we're on ancestral lands of the coastal Miwok, who are the original caretakers of this area. We respectfully acknowledge the indigenous people who have been stewarding and maintaining a relationship on this land as knowledgeable keepers for millennia. This acknowledgement does not take the place of authentic relationships with indigenous communities, but serves as a gesture of respect to the land we are on. Um, with that, we will move on to the next item, which is uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. If you would please join me. Thank you for that. Then we will move on to the approval of the minutes and notice of waiving of reading of all resolutions and ordinances introduced and or adopted under this agenda item and we we have no minutes okay they're not listed on the they're usually listed on the agenda yeah they're in the they're in the packet all right let me go thank you for our october 24th usually it says which ones they are so with that are there any questions of the council on the minutes Okay, and this is an action item. Anyone wishing to speak on this item on the minutes from October 24th? Not seeing anyone jump up or raise their hand here. Uh, Kevin, could you please um, go to our Zoom attendees? Thank you, Mayor Harvey. Speaking to our Zoom attendees, if you'd like to make a public comment on approval of the minutes, please use the raise hand icon at this time. Mayor Harvey, that'll end public comment. Thank you so much for that. Then I would be looking for a motion for the minutes. I'll make the motion to um, approve the minutes of October 24th. Second. I have a motion and a second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstentions? Any opposition? Not seeing any. Kevin, that will pass unanimously. And then we move on to announcements. First item is meeting orientation for new attendees and viewers in conformance with the Brown Act and the adopted city council rules. The meeting agenda includes items labeled as action items where the city council will consider the item and citizens are afforded the opportunity to provide comments relevant to the item being discussed. The meeting agenda also includes a citizen's business item, which is the designated place on the agenda where citizens have the right to say whatever they wish. The city council may or may not choose to respond to comments as the government code allows. However, if the city council declines to respond, it should not be perceived as giving credence to or agreeing with any statements that the city council or its members believed are incorrect, misinformed, or purposely biased. Next, Measure S supports police services, a variety of recreation programs for all ages, and the maintenance of our streets, parks, and public buildings. See details on the web at www.katadicity.org. Okay. Next, citizens interested in receiving City of Katadi community alerts via text or email are encouraged to sign up with Civic Ready by signing up on the city website www.katadicity.org under the How Do I link at the top of the homepage. Next, like always, we'd love to hear from you. So please feel free to contact the city at 707-792-4600 
or info at katadicity.org. If you have a non-emergency issue after normal business hours, you can contact us at 707-792-4611. And of course, if you have an emergency, please contact 911. Continue to look for updates on the city's website and social media channels available on Facebook, Instagram, and Civic Ready. So with that, um, our next item is a presentation. And I believe we have some representatives from the fire department. Um, can we, all right, one, one, one second. Are we going to do, there's been a request to um, move one of the items up from later. Can we do handle that now? Um, or do we have to wait for approval of the final agenda? I think, I mean, I think it's the mayor's prerogative. I was gonna suggest that at the next item, but um, okay. it's prerogative if you wanna do it now. So the, the request is to do it before the presentation? Yes, I'd like to request since, Okay, <laughs> uh, the nominee is here. Okay. Um, can, I, can I just ask, there's, there's some feedback, like a high pitch <clears throat> thing that's happening with the microphones. I don't know if it could be turned down or something. It's just really- That um, happens when um, anyone has their mic open at all times. So if, you, if everyone closes their microphone, that should stop the feedback. Okay. Yeah, none of them up here were, were open except- Just the mine. Members. I'm hearing it right now. Could it, could it be the podium mic that's kind of pointed this way? I don't know. Mayor Harvey, I think if you try muting your microphone, can we see if that works? Um, did it stop? <laughs> yes. All right, so we'll try this again. So Sylvia, I believe the request is to move item 12A, the ratification of nominee for appointment to the Measure S Citizens Oversight Committee up to now. Is that the yes. request? Yes, that was the request. Thank okay. you. Okay, and is everyone okay with that? All okay with that? All right, then we will move that up to now. And do we have a staff presentation on this item? So um, just, I'll, I'll be really brief. We, um, we put out, like we always do, we put out um, uh, an advertisement for the open, the vacant positions. We had two vacant positions. One from, um, uh, basically every council member has an appointment, right? It follows the planning commission appointment process, which is, um, which is essentially that the, um, each council member gets to nominate an individual, and then they take that individual um, before the council and the council ratifies the choice. So um, that's the process. Um, we had two vacancies because we have um, two newer council members, council member Lemus and council member Rivers. Um, uh, council member Lemus has um, nominated uh, Carmen Garcia, who I believe is here tonight. And, um, and that's what this item is before you tonight to discuss. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. There's not much more to it, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Oops, you know, I have to turn it back on again. Are there any questions? Okay. Um, then um, Carmen would, is here. Should we invite her? Yes. Uh, Carmen, would you care to share anything with us? Uh, can, can I just share a little something? Sure. Okay. So I have known Carmen for a long time um, and I know her work, her experience, especially her work in the community. So she had expressed interest some time ago of being involved in the city of Katani. And um, so when vacancies came open, I encouraged her to apply and I'm happy that she did. I think she is a valuable asset here. She's a more than 30 year uh, community resident here in Katani. So I'm really glad that she applied and wants to serve in Measure S committee. Thank you, Carmen. Did you want to share a little bit? Yes. Uh -huh. um, thank you, everybody. My name is Carmen Garcia. I've been resident here at Cotati for the past 34 years. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> for the past 34 years, um, my two daughters grew up here, um, now married with kids. I'm a grandma. I just retired from working in banking for the past 48 years. 
Um, so, uh, you know, I decided to take a couple of months off. And then I said, you know, I've always wanted to be part of the community, be able to help the community. Like Sylvia said, I've been involved in so many nonprofits and this is my city. This is my home. So it's something that I would love to be part of. Does anyone have any questions? Not seeing any. Um, I'd just like to say thank you for applying and being uh, wanting to contribute in this way. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And since this is a, a, an action item, I need to take any other pub public comment on this. Okay. But thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you for applying, Carmen. Thank you. So any member of the public wishing to speak on this ratification of this appointment to the Measure S? I'm not seeing any hands jump up or folks jump up. Could we check with our um, Zoom attendees, please? Speaking to our Zoom attendees, if you'd like to make a public comment on this item, please use the raise hand icon. Mayor Harvey, that'll end public comment. Okay, thank you for that. And again, thank you, Carmen, for um, being willing to serve on the Measure S uh, Oversight Committee. And so I would be looking for a motion. I'll make a motion to nominate um, Carmen Garcia to the Measure S Committee. I'd like to second that. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any no's, any abstentions? That passes unanimously. So welcome, Carmen. Thank you. And thank you for being willing to serve. So now, let's see, where, where am I? <laughs> let's see. Now we will have our presentations. Um, so welcome, Jeff. <laughs> I'm waiting for the music to start <laughs> now. <laughs> You promised. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff Schock. I'm a Katati resident. Um, I voted for Measure S. And since I have the floor, what an amazing thing to see the improvements in our community, specifically the baseball field. I live over by the Vets Memorial Building. And I think um, that baseball field, wow, I think the A's, if, uh, if it doesn't work out in Vegas, they might be looking to come to Katati, <laughs> just so you know. No, very cool stuff. Um, my son goes to Rancho Katati High. I'm a Sonoma State grad, um, but that's not why I'm here. Um, I'm a member of the Sonoma County Fire Chiefs Association subcommittee that's been working on um, ways to help increase funding for vital countywide fire um, protection. And so um, I'm here representing all Sonoma County Fire Chiefs. And with me is uh, your Rancho Adobe Fire Chief, Jeff Feliquet as well as labor representatives and uh, board members from Rancho Adobe Fire Protection District, who obviously provides the fire protection here in Katahdi, as well as Pengrove, Liberty Valley, and up Sonoma Mountain. Uh, and I really just wanna thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, my goal is to provide information on a upcoming uh, tax initiative for the March, 2024 ballot. And uh, the Sonoma County Fire Chiefs Association is not asking for any, any action from you. Just wanna share information and uh, answer any questions that you might have. Uh, the reason for this tax measure is simple and it's in the title, to improve and enhance local fire protection, paramedic services and disaster response. Uh, this is a half cent sales tax that'll be coming before us soon. Um, as I mentioned, it's a countywide, county holistic initiative. It's been written by firefighters and fire chiefs, and uh, it's a measure that we're proud to bring to this community. Uh, post the fires in 2017, um, we all saw um, in fire service and obviously the communities that that with climate change, with uh, increased vegetation, that, that something, something had to be done more in our communities. Uh, fires do not know boundaries. They affect us all. Um, we also have winter storm challenges that have been increasing. Um, and, and we've recognized service gaps that exist within, within our, our county. 
Um, back in 2020, a ballot went on the initiative, or a, a ballot initiative went before voters, uh, March of 2020. That was put on the ballot by the uh, Sonoma County Board of Supervisors. It was the same. It was a half cent sales tax. Um, it was it was put on by the county, and the county asked a subsection of the Fire Chiefs Association to be the technical experts and advisors on coming up with how that money could be spent. But it was not a it was not a fire service driven initiative. That uh, initiative needed two thirds to pass, and it 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 did not pass by a margin of less than two percent. Uh, the fire service working group that was established as part of the Sonoma County Fire Chiefs Association went back to the drawing board. The, the need was still there, but the funding we, we realized was not going to come from the county or from a county measure. Um, we, uh, we took a fresh approach and took ownership of, of that measure and or, or of, of what happened, the lessons learned. We started at square one with a new strategy. Uh, new language, um, new governance model, and now we're looking at uh, potential revenues if this passes of, of a little over $60 million per year going to all county fire agencies. The fire service working group strategized on how that funding could be spent in the, in the old measure G uh, the funding all went to the Board of Supervisors and then was uh, was disseminated to the fire agencies or cities that had fire agencies. And none of that was, uh, it was, it could be flexible. And that was a challenge for many people that not only voted for it, but it was hard to get support from cities when that was the factor. And this codified the distribution uh, on what each city or fire district will receive from this measure. That will not change. It is written into the tax measure. Uh, and, and we really took a more holistic countywide approach to this. We met with, uh, with all fire agencies in Sonoma County for years specifically. We met with Rancho Adobe Fire Prediction District on what were their needs and and really what does, we did a standards of coverage study on response times and all that data, but then really met with every fire agency to determine what do the technical experts within each community feel that they need to, to better serve their community. And that's how we came up with the distribution plan and how that funding would be, would be allocated. Um, this, uh, this was a different measure in the fact it was, it was signature driven. We collected over 20,000 signatures to put this on the ballot. That did two things. One, it showed that the community had an interest in this measure and was willing to support uh, a tax that would help fund increased fire and paramedic services in the county. It also did another thing, it changed the threshold. It only requires a simple majority to pass. We're still hopeful of two thirds. There's, you might've heard of the business round table and there's been a lot of developments in the last two weeks and two months on that and, and how much of a impact that may or may not have in any, any uh, March election. But we are uh, hoping for a two thirds. Uh, we've we've uh, changed the fire service working group representation. The biggest is bringing labor on board. Um, not just the board of supervisors and a, and a few fire chiefs, but really all of the fire service in Sonoma County and having their input into, into this. Uh, we've also, uh, I met some of you back in June in Sebastopol when we did a presentation when this was really just getting started, hadn't even got, been approved yet by the board of supervisors but we made presentations to the mayors and council association, the city managers groups. And uh, last night held a, well, I shouldn't talk about that. That's something that labor's doing. This is informational. I'm not here to advocate. Um, as I mentioned with this new ordinance, it was, it was, it's gonna be managed by the Sonoma County Fire Chiefs. It was written by firefighters. We've got a new oversight committee with representations from cities, uh, districts, Taxpayers Association uh, and elected officials. Mm -hmm. 
there's a little list of the on the slide of, of what the oversight committee uh, who, who will be represented on that and really it's just making sure that there's total transparency to our community on on what the funds are being spent for and going towards what this measure was meant to support. A little more detail on on uh, on the checks and balances and uh, and the specifics. Specifically for Rancho Adobe, where the the where you receive your fire protection and disaster response, as well as the vegetation management component. Uh, Rancho Adobe, it's codified, will receive 3.5% of the total allocation, which at 60 million a year is estimated about, uh, would be $2.1 million annually. Nearly 20% of the total allocation goes to shared countywide benefits. So don't they don't necessarily go to each specific agency, but they're used for things like um, currently Rancho Adobe pays um, for their dispatch fees through a countywide JPA. This this tax measure would fund all of the all of the dispatch fees. It would provide uh, countywide vegetation management crew, and uh, it would it would support the upstaffing currently. The county was funding, the County Board of Supervisors was funding red flag upstaffing uh, and winter storm upstaffing when there was an in increased threat. We've been doing that since 2017. Um, the Board of Supervisors are no longer funding that. And this, this tax measure will fund those things. Every several times a year, Rancho Adobe will have an extra engine company on duty during those hot, dry, windy days or when when there's significant chance of flooding, they'll have increased crews on the street ready to respond. And this measure will help fund that. With this measure, we've increased our partnerships. Um, vegetation management is a large component of this. It's not just about boots on the ground providing response. It's about prevention measures. Uh, there will be fire prevention specialists strategically placed throughout the county. As I mentioned, there will be a crew that's actually doing the work. Uh, like shaded fuel breaks or, bless you, uh, widening the fuel breaks along current roadways. This is not clear cutting. This is not harmful impacts to the environment. It's, it's um, reducing the amount of fuel that, that gives firefighters a chance to make a difference when these fires spread. Specifically for Rancho Adobe, uh, they intend on using this funding for upgrades to the Katati station. Uh, upgrades and expansion to their fire station three, which is in the Liberty Valley, uh, training facility enhancements, adding paramedic level services to each of the fire engines that respond within your community. And then the addition of personnel for operational oversight, apparatus maintenance, fire training and vegetation management. And then the indirect financial benefits uh, are listed there as well. And I do have uh, Chief Veliquit here with me as well. If you have any questions, I can answer them more specific to the measure, or if you have questions more specific to the specific impacts uh, to your community, be happy to answer any of those. Thank you. I thought you were going to tell me that if there's any questions, you are going to give them to him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, questions? Okay. Yes, Sylvia. Uh, yes, um, I wanted to hear more about your vegetation management strategies. Um, if, is that something that you are going to develop crews or you already have crews or um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, great question. There's, so the county has developed a CWPP and that's where I might need Jeff's help on that. But it's basically a countywide plan of where the risks ex exist within the county and what the priorities should be. Um, there's foundations like Fire Safe Sonoma that, uh, that this tax measure will, will help fund an executive director for that is currently volunteer to kind of help take what all those recommendations are, help prioritize that and, and determine what next steps are needed. Um, and those steps will be performed specifically by a most likely 20 person crew that are personnel with, you know, with the chainsaws and the hand tools and similar to the Cal Fire model that are, that are um, you see actually during a fire response, but these would not be direct firefighting, maybe, but they'd be working year round 
doing doing that work. So yes, this would specifically fund that 20 person crew. I'm not sure if you're aware of it's a part of your plan, but there are some nonprofits here in Sonoma County that have been training farm workers on how to do uh, vegetation management and home hardening. Are you working with any of those groups? Um, yep, we've, um, there are, there are many, that's what's so great about our community. There are so many different groups that provide so many essential services. And for the fire, for the Sonoma County Fire Chiefs Association to be able to manage all of that it, is difficult. And so what we've done is we've partnered with Fire Safe Sonoma to kind of be the, the clearinghouse for not only um, prioritizing projects, but, but, but absolutely. It's a, it's, so the groups like that you mentioned, when there's a need, um, there's an avenue to, to have a conversation, get a project prioritized, and then for this vegetation management crew that we're, that we're supporting through this tax manager to help, help do that work. Or any, there's, there's funding in here for training of personnel, training the community. Um, and that's part of that extra 20% that's, uh, that's not being directly allocated to specific agencies. Thank you. So Fire Safe Sonoma would be the ones that would identify kind of crews and uh, people that would be okay. Right, yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yes, Laura. I just had a quick question. I know this is a small amount of the money, but I, I noticed the Lexapol fees would be paid out of this. I was just curious, is um, Rancho Adobe using Lexapol for your policy manuals now already, or is that something that's going to be added? We are using Lexapol for our policy manual. Yes. In fact, um, we use it for our policy manual and procedures manual. So it's been part of our um, system for maybe five or six years. Thank you. And th those are those indirect benefits. Um, the red, you know, the dispatch fees, the Lexapol policies that that uh, have an even more benefit on than just a direct financial contribution. Um, so I appreciate the countywide approach. I think the patchwork parcel fee approach, you know, leads to kind of craziness where one agency will have a $50 parcel tax and the next one a $300 parcel tax. But I'm just wondering if this, um, is this kind of an avenue to trying to even out those issues in the future or does this, because we, for instance, in Rancho Adobe, re just recently passed a significant parcel tax to supposedly fund what was needed. So I'm just curious how this intersects with that parcel tax model. It's uh, absolutely fire districts have parcel taxes and there's other funding sources. This, this was really meant to take, to, um, to take the county as a whole. And what, what's interesting about it is like a lot of the cities city of Santa Rosa specifically, if you were to do an allocation on, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to your question specifically, but if you were to take like a per capita, how this funding would be allocated, then we'd still see those existing service gaps in areas that don't, ha that don't have necessarily the, the per capita or the, or the shopping centers, et cetera. Um, we have a lot of uh, visitors to our community as well. A lot of the service impacts that we see, whether it's medical responses or car accidents on your way to the coast um, are encountered by, by people that aren't paying a parcel tax in our community. So by doing it as a sales tax initiative, and if they're here enjoying our restaurants and hotels, and they're using the services that are being, the emergency services are being provided, um, then they're helping contrib contribute to that. So that was just one other uh, avenue. And then also wanting to um, some some fire districts or cities still maybe need other, this, this doesn't fix everything, um, but it, it, it's, it's a significant step and there's still avenues if communities do need additional support or then there are those opportunities this way. And I think put another way, it does not rescind those that are in place, they will stay in place. Correct, correct. So. Um, I have a question because um, it's, as you said, I believe you were used the words codified, how much each area is going to get. And um, overall, uh, there has been efforts to consolidate. And I know that that will continue 
to happen. Um, so my question is, as consolidation occurs, how does that get reallocated? Where does that go? So for instance, as an example in here, you have CSA 40, which has been consolidated. So how does that work yes. with this? Uh, there, there will be no no change. So if if two agencies merge, that same amount of funding will then go. It'll come, I'm not sure specifically if it's two checks from the county, but that same that allocation will not change. So in your specific example, if two agencies are each getting two and a half percent and they merge, that new agency gets five percent. Okay. Uh, I just and, wasn't sure how that how that was gonna work. Did it like yeah, <laughs> it, it doesn't go away, and you know, not all not all consolidations lead to um, financial benefit, but they do. You know, re oftentimes there's an efficiency benefit and an improvement in the level of service. So, um, yeah, we want to make sure that we didn't, uh, or you know, there wasn't a there was no negative to consolidation by by an agency losing their portion because that, that, that part of the community still needs that portion mm -hmm. of, as you know. Right. Yes. So, yeah. I just, I wasn't sure. And there wasn't enough information for me to know exactly how that would work. And I just didn't want it to go back to say the County. Yeah. Oh, it's a well, good question. We consolidates. And that, that was, many, one, yeah. of, that was a, yeah. one of the many things that um, you get a bunch of firefighters in a room who aren't used to writing ballot measures. Yeah. And we obviously have uh, legal representation and consultants on board, but those are great. Those are questions that we, that we not struggled with, but had to answer yeah. based on exactly what you're talking well, about. Well, especially since you put specific percentages right. in the language, if that entity doesn't exist anymore, you have to accommodate what to do with that. So yeah, exactly. I'm glad you thought of that. Any other questions? Okay, well, um, I'm going to let you sit down momentarily, but I will open this up for public comment and I may need you to come back and answer uh, questions from the public. Perfect. Thank you very That's much okay. for the opportunity. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you so much. So with that, um, I, yes. Yeah. Um, I did have one quick question sort of, um, <laughs> on, uh, building on what Ben asked is so, um, the communities that do have these parcel taxes, is there any accommodation for that with like, were we, so for example, in our district, do we pay less than an area that doesn't have one or do we all pay the same increase? Uh, in the sales tax? Yes. Or the, so we, so th that was a challenge. There are some agencies that, um, so basically we looked at everybody's need. Um, this measure, even at the significant amount of money it has made it about halfway there from what people brought to the table. And we had to use things um, like the standards of coverage and, and looking at operational efficiencies. Like, well, actually if there's one added fire engine here, then you don't each need one because there's one here and kind of trying to do that. Um, we try, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought on, on your question. You say that one more time. Yeah, my, my question is, so like for our district, we do have a parcel tax that we right. pay for. So my question is, when it goes for the sales tax, was there any accommodation for that? In other words, people who are already having a parcel tax pay the same amount of sales tax. In other words, both taxes rather than are in some way pay less than an area that doesn't have the parcel tax. I, I, I believe... Most areas do have a parcel tax, but there are wide variations. And there was not a, there was not a, con everybody will, will obviously pay the same sales tax, but, but there was absolutely a, a fairness factor. If there's one agency that already wasn't doing their fair share, they didn't receive triple the funding because, um, because they were, the city of Katari is not, didn't receive didn't receive less funding for this tax measure because they were already doing pretty good because they had passed a parcel tax. We tried to make that um, based on the need that existed within a community and what their challenges were, and there wasn't a consideration for what current parcel taxes were. Did that answer? So we so so we passes. do pay more than that's what I'm hearing. 
So if people who have parcel taxes will pay the parcel tax and the sales tax yes, as yes, well. Yes. So people who do not have the parcel tax only pay the sales tax. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Thanks again. So um, I do have one speaker card, Michael Hilbert. Welcome. Yes, my name is Michael Hilbert. I'm a resident of Sonoma County, unincorporated area. I would expect to see uh, more new crew cab pickups, you know, driving back and forth to Oliver's Market. That's what I would anticipate seeing out of this. We're cultivating a spoiled uh, firefighter hero class, and, and they're getting greedy. Like you said, you know, there's substantial parcel taxes already for many of these agencies. I understand Grayton to be $450, and that would not go away. <clears throat> In the case of Katati, a half percent will drive your cumulative sales tax to 10%. You know, and that doesn't look good. You know, that puts you in the ranks of like Oakland and, you know, uh, you know, financially strapped cities that are just taxing people to death and compounding their problems by punishing the people who can afford it the least with a regressive tax. So I would urge people to, uh, you know, strongly consider voting no on this. You know, it's taken for granted that you got to vote yes on everything that's got fire associated with it. But, you know, don't take that as a given. When it comes to vegetation management, I, I know firsthand that they go around with a, a digital camera and they take pictures and they mail out, uh, you know, bills to people accusing them of not having their grass adequately mowed. So. You know, I don't think we need more of that either. And in the case of Sebastopol, you know, they have a the tremendous difficulty funding their fire department, but that's just because they manage, mismanage the, the tax revenue they do have. And, you know, so they don't re deserve to be rewarded with, a, you know, supplemental uh, funding stream to uh, offset their mismanagement. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else in the audience here wishing to speak on this item? Not seeing anyone else jump up. So can we move to our Zoom attendees? Thank you, Mayor Harvey. Speaking to our Zoom attendees, if you'd like to make a public comment on this item, please use the raise hand icon. Lori, you have the floor. Hi, um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Lori, faint, faintly, can you speak up a little bit louder or get closer to your microphone? Can you hear me now? That's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> um, first, my um, I had a written comment about this presentation I sent to all of you. I sent it to the fire district, and it's nowhere to be found under on the new program. Um, so um, there's no public comments on any items, even non-action comments. So I'll try to summarize what this uh, my written one was. Um, basically, it was the double whammy. We have three hundred dollars, and then we'll have half percent. That was my only concern. Um, I am a I really support the Rancho Adobe Fire District. They saved my mom's life and they saved our home nine years ago, miraculously. So, but the problem is, is that there is a legislation that will, right now there's a 3% cap um, temporarily to sales tax. And if they don't do a county's tax within uh, by 2026, I think, within the next two years, um, then it will remain. Um, if they come up with a county tax and the fire tax passes, it, they'll have the 3% cap forever. If they don't do any kind of county tax by 2026, it'll go back to the 2% cap over this on um, sales tax. So this 
I'm not against the fire tax. I'm against this thought solidifying that our um, sales cap will can make our tax in Katati up to 10.5% um, given this um, legislation that went through. And that's basically my comment. Thank you for your comments. Is that Mayor Harvey, that will end public comment. Okay, then um, I will bring it back to the council for additional comments, questions. Yes, Kay. Um, I just saw you shake your head. Did you want to make a comment about that? Sure. Thank you. Um, I think there's a lot of information in that last comment. Um, and it's, I've learned more about taxes and tax caps than I ever thought I would. They don't teach that in fire school. Um, but it, 10 it, it'd be a half a cent sales tax and 10, I shook my head because 10 and a half percent is stated what the tax would be is, is not accurate. I also, I also, from what I know, yes, there is a tax cap extension that was, that was done specifically for Sonoma County. If you look at that, that was done specifically for Sonoma County after the wildfires that we experienced starting in 2017. And the reason to raise that tax cap was to give Sonoma County the opportunity to do whatever was needed. It was very vague, but it was directly, directly related to the fire impacts. So that was given to Sonoma County to and advocated for by Sonoma County, not just the county, but all of us at Sonoma to say, hey, we, we might need something. We're not sure exactly what that is. And, and we've developed that. I haven't gone into huge detail on all that this will provide, um, but we have decided what we need, and that's what we're that's what we're advocating for. And I just shook my head because, um, yes, Katadi is at nine and a half percent, so it would be ten. And ten, I agree, ten is a horrible number. When I did the math, I went, oh man, could it be nine point nine nine like our gas? You know, it's in nine tenths. It's a it's a hard number to hear, and it it is a little bit of a gut wrench, but it's not ten and a half percent, and it and it it also does not the results of this does not affect whether the tax cap will change or expire. I don't believe that's the case. I, again, I didn't learn that in fire school, but I I believe that was inaccurate too. This this the, if this tax passes, it doesn't affect whether the existing tax cap extension will change. And then two other items while you're standing there then. Um, can you speak to the comment about vegetation management? Uh, I thought I heard that you're planning on physically doing some ve vegetation management yes. rather so, than just telling people go do it. Yeah. Is so we so we do the same in Petaluma. We have a vegetation management program and I know Rancho Adobe does as well. If you have private property and your grass needs to be mowed as it should every year so that if a fire starts it doesn't doesn't burn your house and it doesn't burn your neighbor's house. And that that I believe remains. People are obligated to take care of their their private property. And if you don't do that in the time that the fire department allocates, then, and it goes through the process, then, then we as a, as a community pays for that and seeks reimbursement from the landowner. That will not change with this. What this does is those areas along roadways um, that are, that are county owned land or city roads that need that extra support to widen current um, natural breaks with roadway systems or for larger projects um, on um, I'm trying to think on on Sonoma Mountain that are um, I, I can't get into too much I don't understand too much specifics on what's in that CWPP and what the rec recommendations are but there will absolutely be improvements made yes physically this measure will fund physically taking care of vegetation management and increasing the amount of fuel breaks to give firefighters more of a chance, but it will not affect um, the private property homeowner's responsibility. And lastly, it was my understanding and I could be wrong. Uh, the comment was made about uh, y'all be driving around in new uh, crew cab trucks. My understanding was that equipment, if you will, uh, trucks and things are not, part of this and that they will not be, this 
Yep. So, be allowed. so, so that was something that, that many fire agencies asked for was funding to replace equipment. And that goes back to the, that goes back to the, there was more, there was more need than there is funding. So across the board, we decided that was not going to be the intent of this measure. Now I taught, um, so no, it's not part of the direct funding for this. Okay. That it's, 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 it's personnel, it's vegetation management and it's facility upgrades. And a lot of the facility upgrades are not only, you know, mold abatement, seismic, but also a big one. And I'll speak specifically for Petaluma um, just because it's, we, we can't accommodate a diverse workforce. Our workforce diversity is increasing and we're trying hard to do that. And and it's not a great place with shared, shared showers and shared bedrooms. Um, and so we need to do a better job as, uh, as a community to, to create environments, fire stations, where people can work and have privacy and all the things that people deserve. So that's what we're hoping to accomplish. Okay. And not to... fall down in an earthquake. That's important too. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Um, I just like to say I'm really glad to hear about the diversity because I definitely noticed in the slideshow that it, a lot of the faces look very similar. It's true. One, I, I have, can I make a comment on that? You're you're absolutely right, and we're we're that's a challenge. We we are now, you know, you go to the fire academies at the junior college to try to do recruitment efforts, and when. 28 of the 30 are white males, it's really hard to get a diverse workforce when your candidate pool isn't diverse. So Rancho Adobe, Petaluma, all fire agencies are doing a better job. And, and part of this measure funds, I believe it's about, I think it's 250,000 a year for training. And a big impact is getting into the high schools to, to, encourage people to then go to the junior college, whether it's EMT or paramedic, and really help foster that workforce. We're looking at hiring 150 to 200 firefighters. We, we need diversity because it's the right thing to do, but also we need, we need a workforce. We want it, part of this measure is helping develop that future workforce in our community. And that'll, that ties right into, you know, we want our workforce to look just like our community does. So this will help with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for answering all the questions. And thank you for all for being here for this. So there is no action. So we will um, move forward on this. And the next item on the agenda is approval of the final agenda. Thank you, Mayor. No further changes. No. OK. You. All right. And does anyone wish to comment on the approval of the final agenda? Since this is an action, not seeing anyone jump up here. Um, Kevin, could we check with our Zoom attendees? Thank you, Mayor Harvey. Speaking to our Zoom attendees, if you'd like to make a public comment on this item, please use the raise hand icon. Mayor Harvey, that'll end public comment. All right, well, thank you for that. Then we will move on to citizens business and public comment for the consent calendar items. Any member of the public wishing to speak to the council on any item or items listed on the consent calendar or any matters not listed on the agenda that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council may do so at this time. Pursuant to the Brown Act, the council is not allowed to consider issues or take action on any item not listed on the agenda during this period. Pursuant to city council policy 2023-01, Comments of any member of the public are normally restricted to a total of three minutes in length per person for matters not on the agenda and a total of three minutes per person in length for any and all items on the consent calendar. The mayor may extend the time limit for a reasonable time where disability accommodation has been requested. To facilitate public comment, the clerk will alert speakers when there is 30 seconds remaining. And so with that, is anybody wishing to speak on uh, citizens business or the consent calendar? Not seeing anyone jump up for those items. Uh, can we check with the Zoom attendees? 
Speaking to our Zoom attendees, please use the raise hand icon at this time to make a public comment. Lori, you have the floor. Um, I would like to speak about the code enforcement program and um, Katati and Mr. Smith's um, source scam he has on going on the whole county here. Um, you all, um, he, in, he was the city prosecutor in Sonoma and did code enforcement. And then he went and um, developed a code enforcement program for his retirement, got so much money from the city of Sonoma. You guys adopted him in 2018 um, under contract. He totally changed the codes, made himself the prosecutor, the uh, building official, everything, um, making it unfair situation it basically you, we have to have a trial um, instead of a public hearing and now since it worked so well in city in the city of Gatati for him he's moved on and done it in the city of Cloverdale and the city, town of Windsor he's going around collecting contracts for code enforcement that work against the city the citizens of the city um, we were promised when he was hired in 2018 that it would be a gentler, um, gentler experience and there would be no selective enforcement. And right now, there is major selective enforcement. Um, Ask Noah about 46 videos that were sent by a neighbor facilitated by him um, to against George Barrick, there, this needs to stop. You guys need to stop the selective enforcement. You need to change the code enforcement program and take it away from Robert Smith, who is running you all on a scam. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Mayor Harvey, that'll end public comment. All right, then uh, we will move on since we've already taken public comment on the consent calendar, is there any items that anyone wishes to pull? Not seeing anyone then, I would be, we have three items on the consent calendar. The first one is Katati Police Officers Association side letter to add the records analyst position. The second item is acceptance of improvements for the community center window replacement project. And the third is acceptance of the 2023 pavement rehabilitation project. So I would be looking for a motion for those items. I move to approve the consent calendar items. And I'll I, second. I was just gonna second with appreciation for projects that come in under budget. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay, so we have a, we have a motion in a second, all in favor. Aye. 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 Any no's, any abstentions, not seeing any. Kevin, that passes um, unanimously. And then we will move on to item 11, which is direction on future agenda items. I, I just like to bring up the three that I keep bringing up. And uh, so can I just ask, like, do we just like, at some point here when they're going to be put on the agenda? Like, how does that work? Or we just ask for them every time? And yeah, well, I mean, um, so so I work with the mayor and try to agendize things as they're ready. But um, we do have a mid-year check-in as well, you know, to talk about the status of all the projects. So okay. at the mid-year, we'll be talking about it. And then, of course, obviously, every year when we develop the budget during strategic planning, we talk about that as well. Okay, so the, the three are the um, uh, investigating about opening uh, or reopening a uh, library here in Katati, and then reinstating the Citizen Police Oversight Committee. Um, and just because we do know about the uh, um, change in police chiefs, it seems like a really good time to bring it back when this process is happening. 
um, and then uh, looking into term limits for us, for the city council. Thank you. Anything else? Not seeing anything. Um, so we already addressed um, item A on the regular agenda. So we will move on to item B, which is the first quarter financial report for fiscal year 2023-24, including update on cash and actively managed investments. And I'm gonna guess that this is Angela. I was gonna let Damien take it, but maybe I'll do it this time. Okay. So good evening, Mayor, Council members, fellow staff, and our community participants, yay. Uh, tonight I'll be presenting to you our first quarter financial review for fiscal year 2023-24. I'll let Kevin drive the slide deck so that we don't run over there and do that. So the next slide. With this review, we'll go over the citywide revenues and expenses, uh, then more detailed into the general and enterprise funds, followed by the cash and investments portfolio. So next slide. And then go ahead, next slide again. So for the citywide, I do wanna note that there were some uh, minor changes to the slide deck. Uh, from the original posting. Uh, copies are available on the back of the chamber um, and they'll be presented in the presentation, of, of course. The first minor addition was the description of revenues and expenses on this page. So the revenues and expenses, uh, yes, are considered on target and with bu within budget aligned with prior years. But it's really important to note that this is all expenses, which include capital expenditures or transfers out, not just the operating expenses. Um, so with 25% of the year complete, revenues are at approximately 16.8% of budget. Uh, and this is preliminary due to the timing of receipts. As we know, sales tax is a big part of our revenue and it lags two months behind the actual sales tax month. Um, and that first distribution of property taxes are not received until December. Um, alternatively, expenditures are at approximately 18.4% of budget. And so we'll go into a little bit more detail in the different sections for those major changes for the general and water and wastewater funds. So on to the general fund details on the next slide. And again, I just like shoving pictures in there. It's nice to see people's faces. It's not just a bunch of numbers. So here in the second is the second slide that's been modified based on providing a little bit more detail on that operating versus non-operating net income. Um, so we do have an operating, um, uh, not a deficit. So we have operating income that then gets added to our fund balance, which then we kind of collect every year. So we get grant funding to match it. Sorry, we have the buzzing going on in here. <laughs> Might be my microphone too. So let me know if you hear it again and I need to turn it off. Um, so just to say that, that the operating income then contributes to our fund balance. We collect those fund balances. There we go. And that goes to future capital projects. <laughs> We're gonna keep hearing the buzzing. I'm sorry, just keep reminding me to turn it off. Um, so for so far um, that we're overall budget net operations is slightly more negative by 1.6% or $8,000. So compared to prior year for the fiscal year budget, we plan on an operating revenue of just over $1 million. Again, these funds are what uh, go into surplus, surplus operating funds and what support current and future capital projects for the city. For the current fiscal year, the budget adopted just over 5 million to be used to support these um, significant capital project catch-ups, as well as other grant matching projects on hand. The detail on the general fund expenditures by function and by department was included on packet page 75 within the whole quarterly report. I just try to provide a summary of that in our presentation. Additionally, there's a summary of the revenues on packet page 74. Next slide. So transitioning to the general fund operating revenues, there's just over 1.5 million or 5.6% increase over the same period in the prior year. This increase is primarily related to other agency fees, um, timing of transfers in, and those were related to grant reimbursements. So the city had to wait to get the money from the grants back in. So the expense happens, we have to pay for those expenses. So the general fund can do some contrib contributions to those. And then we pull back those funds when the grant money comes back in. Um, and then of course our increased investment returns were the biggest piece of that. 
So the major revenue sources still remain to be uh, the same for this quarter, where more than 60% of it is from sales tax, which we did see a slight drop of around 0.7%. Um, That's really in line with our conservative budgeting. We know some sales um, taxes are, are decreasing as uh, consumers' activities are changing. And so that is a part of our conservative budgeting, but we're gonna continue to work with our consultants mm -hmm. and making sure our mid-year uh, budget analysis is in line with where we, we need to be. So if you look at this graph, approximately half of the sales tax, and this is generated by our local Measure S sales tax. Next slide. So uh, next, let's get into our enterprise funds for water and wastewater, also known as sewer. I like wastewater, it sounds nicer, or not nicer. It's, it really is what it is, you're wasting the water. But as a reminder, these funds are operated similar to a business where revenues are derived from charges for services for the water and wastewater treatment services or connections and expenses are for water purchases or the distribution and the wastewater treatment by Santa Rosa. We also have expenses related to insurance and staffing, as well as our capital infrastructure, including repairs and maintenance, like our annual water flushing program. This period shows two months of revenue as we currently are on still the bi-monthly billing process. So as we look to move more to the monthly billing, I look forward to these quarterly reports actually being more representative of a three month cycle um, and more in line with what our expenses are uh, every month. Next slide, please. So again, this report combines the operating and capital outlay and debt service under these expenses. Overall revenues are increased from prior year for water due to increased rates and consumption. For wastewater, the increase is less due, is, is less, the increase is less due to the re-averaging reductions as uh, individuals increase their conservation during the winter season in the prior year. So we do believe that the budget will be more aligned and will again, just like the general fund, continue to look out further and be able to look at through the revenues on a more regular basis once we move to monthly and uh, as we are also looking in our forecasting uh, into the future. So expenses for the year are at 19% and 21% respectively for water and wastewater funds. Most expenses are in line with prior year, but with differences due to timing of contracts and capital projects. We also saw increases in wastewater treatment costs as well as water purchase costs. And of course, our insurance cost, which is allocated across these funds as well. These costs will continue to be monitored and reported out again at mid-year, and we'll identify if there's any reason we would see a need to do a budget adjustment at that time. Next slide. So on to our cash and investments. Um, in the agenda packet for the evening, we provided supplemental investment reports showing the earnings to date using our new active investment management policy and our partners with Optimize Investment Partners um, should also be on the line and hopefully available to answer any questions you have related to those as well. Um, this is provided in packet pages 66 to 70. Um, so uh, if there's any additional questions, we'll deal with that at that time um, around our cash modeling. So next slide. Oh, go back one more, sorry. Thank you. So overall cash investments as of September 30th was at 21.1 million, which was an increase of approximately 1.8 million over the prior year's 19.3 million. Sorry, I know that's a lot of numbers. I just threw in one sentence, but it's an overall increase of 1.8 million. As you can hopefully see in the breakout, there is very little funding now included in LAFE. It's really just to keep the account active and operating in case we need to do transfers in case their rate of return increases over what we're currently getting in camp. Um, so again, most of the cash investments are held in liquid funds through camp with approximately 6.6 .6 million or in laddered investments of CDs and treasury with US Bank at almost 10 million. These investments for just this quarter are in the city approximately $205,000 in return. So next slide, thank you. So here are the graphs showing these same $21.1 million in funds kind of in different distributions. The bottom graph shows the distribution as was outlined in the last, um, this kind of spreadsheet style, where it's the different um, 
sources where all the, the funds are being held. Alternatively, we have where the funds for the city, the cash balances are actually being held in their pooled cash fund. Where special revenue funds, primarily inclusionary housing, has approximately 4.25 million. The water and wastewater have approximately a combined 7.6 million, and the general fund has 2.9 million. Next slide. So with this, you know, we're still moving through our fiscal year. We consider this really on track. It's hard to judge in their first quarter, but comparing it to prior years, first quarter, um, as well as our budget, our expenses are primarily under that 25%. Our revenues are in line with what we would expect given when revenues come in for sales tax, property tax, and likewise. Um, and so we'll continue to evaluate this and bring any updates back to council with our mid-year report. We're not requesting any budget adjustments at this time. And uh, we look forward to bringing you more information on our investments as uh, they continue to support city services. So I'll be happy to take any questions you might have at this time. I will open this up for public comment. Anyone in the office, I'm seeing shaking heads no, then I will go to Kevin for our Zoom comments. Thank you, Mayor Harvey. Speaking to our Zoom attendees, please use the raise hand icon if you'd like to make a public comment. Lori, you have the floor. Hi, um, I just wanted to um, address that. It seems that there is a, just on the budget, budgeted expenditures and budgeted revenue, you have a $5 million um, structural deficit. There's 5 million more of expenditures than of all the, the sewer and the all that and the general fund than there are of revenues. And we haven't heard anything about how you're gonna meet this structural deficit um, over the year. And that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. My you have a question? Oh, okay. I was gonna let Angela answer that question. Um, absolutely. Speak so, to that question. So that's something we're looking to hopefully uh, improve and provide more information on our quarterly reports because that's all done during our budget strategic planning and our budget adoption where those funds were identified as a part of our fund balance um, usage. Um, and so, yes, we have operating uh, returns where they exceed our, op our revenues exceed our expenses. Those go into our fund balance and we've been doing that for several years. Um, and so we do have su sufficient fund balance that we're using for our strategic projects at this time. So uh, I hope that meets her question. Sorry, sorry I'll just, I'll just <laughs> add. In first. Yeah, I'll just add, I'll just add, I mean, there is no structural deficit. It's, <laughs> It's um, our operating revenues exceed our operating expenses. That's the definition of an, if, you, if that wasn't the case, that would be the definition of a structural deficit. That is not the case. Our operating revenues exceed our operating expenses. What you see in that one table is that um, the council would program some significant capital projects in the, in the budget year. So um, when you have operating revenues that exceed operating expenses, that excess gets put in fund balance and over time, that fund balance is used for big capital projects. And that's what's happening in the budget this year. And to add to that, I think Angela or Damien, um, we have been well above our reserve policy and putting aside money specifically for um, some of these larger capital improvements. And so we're bringing some of that reserve down more closely aligned with our policy to help fund those capital improvements. Do I have that? Yeah, yeah, we. Close? Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes, we exceed the our required. Uh, we far exceed our required twenty five percent for general fund and thirty three percent for the water and wastewater funds as a, a fund balance. Um, we strategically try and keep it more than uh, five, fifty percent. 
for our budget adoption process. And the policy is 25, right? 25, correct. My recollection was this budget had a 50 or 52 percent, yeah, um, fund balance after the year was over and all the expenditures were done that were shown in that chart, including those expenditures that are that are mentioned yes. in the budget. Um, Laura, did you have another question? Or was I, that... I was just going to ask to clarify yeah. that we yeah. do not have a structural deficit, and uh, the city manager did that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ben, did you have a question? All right, so hopefully that is clear. If there's nothing else, then we can move on from this item. And we, the next item is resolution to approve MOU for shared animal licensing services using DocuPet. I'm not sure who's taken this one <laughs> that way. Yeah, it's, it's Angela again. <laughs> oh, Angela yes. again, okay. Yeah, this is the Angela show tonight, sorry. Oh. Missed one meeting and then I decided to take over the next one. So um, I, I'm really gonna be brief, no presentation on this, just a quick um, thank you to the city of Roner Park. We've been trying to find ways to best promote our dog licensing program. It was uh, highly managed by our uh, community services officer as a part of the police department. And when she retired, I thought this was a great opportunity for the administrative services department to be able to function because we already did a lot of the cash collections and, um, and receding for the program. And we wanted to just kind of take that in to make it more efficient program for them. And while we took it over and we ran it as she ran it, it's still not quite the same ease of process that our citizens really deserve um, and our, our animals in our community deserve. And so uh, we had been looking at different programs and even the dispatch uh, at the police department had said, hey, these are other programs we had looked at before. And so we uh, were independently looking at DocuPet and it's a rather expensive program. Uh, we looked into other programs or uh, joining services with, uh, I believe what Petaluma uses, um, animal care services. Um, so we had looked at other ones and uh, in talking with the city of Roner Park, uh, they were changing their ERP system and were looking to also change their animal licensing program and were, had already started an agreement, uh, negotiations with DocuPet. And so using this as an opportunity, uh, we were able to bring, we would be able to bring more licenses into their system if we combined our resources, which then reduced their fees they were paying overall to join the program. So bringing the city of Katati's uh, animal licenses to their program as a combined resource for both of our communities, um, which would then be also managed by the animal shelter of Runner Park, who also serves as our animal shelter, um, would both provide efficiencies as well as clear guidance to citizens of both communities as to where to go to license their animals. Uh, this is the same program that is used in a joint services by Sonoma County and Santa Rosa currently. So they have a similar modeling program where it's for both um, areas that service the, the animal licensing. Um, but there are, there are different uh, license programs. So they have different fees, and, but it's still in the same portal where you go to process this. Um, this leads to uh, efficiencies for our community. The dogs don't know what jurisdictions there are, you know, and, and officers who go to pick them up don't know what jurisdictions they are. So having this shared border with the county and Roner Park will better serve it having all the data within DocuPet for our dispatchers and our community members to know where to go and look this up. Um, the only cost to Katati for joining this program is uh, what we've negotiated to approximately, uh, I think it was $1.50 per license um, per year. So uh, it equates to very minimal cost for us that it, it's less than the cost of a materials that we were buying to support the program, not even the staff time and additional services. So, or the um, software that we were using, you know, our access database and as well as the fees for um, processing the credit cards on our online portal. So this really is a um, benefit to, uh, or staff feel this is, would be a benefit to our community to best serve everyone and a joint system. So this, what is being proposed is an MOU with the city of Roner Park they're currently um, going through legal review for the MOU and look to take it for approval 
there as well. And so we're hoping to get approval here for uh, for the MOU for the shared services. Um, granted, any you know minor changes that might come out of their evaluation. Let's see. Questions? No, I just want to say I appreciate the collaboration. I think it's a great idea. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good point that you make, especially with the very interesting boundary lines that we have with the city of Roner Park. And the dogs don't know that on this side of the street, you're in Roner Park, and on this side of the street, you're in Katati. So um, I think that that's a good idea whenever we can share services. Um, I, I'm wondering when I read through the terms and conditions, is, is there a reason why um, we're not part of the contract and that we're separate? Um, it, it was really for ease of convenience. They had already worked through the entire contract and we're such a small piece of it. I want them to, to deal with the main management of it, but we are negotiated as a piece of managing the actual program and the setup as a part of the MOU. And Damien, you can speak to that. Yeah, I think also it just gets messy when you try to do a three-party agreement like that. Um, it's better if you have a single um, contracted entity and then we'd be working under Roner Park. So the MOU is mostly about our obligations um, to each other, the city of Katahdin Roner Park. Okay, then the only other thing is uh, um, Ronert Parks needs an apostrophe on letter A, 3A, thanks. And isn't the contract with the shelter? We, we currently have a contract with the shelter. Right, but the shelter is contracting with DocuPet or the city of Ronert Park is, okay, because it talked Park, about yeah the funding going back and forth between the shelter and then the shelter pay, paying yeah. Roner Park or us. So it was not real clear. So it's the, the city of Roner Park is entering into the agreement with okay. designated any of the revenue from it is to go to the shelter. Um, so it's kind of like their special revenue fund. So all of that revenue needs to go to the shelter and that's who would be paying us okay. back for our fees. Yes. So it's quite the triangle. Okay. Any other questions? Um, then I will open this item up for public comment. Anyone in the, oh, no, no takers here. So um, can we check with our Zoom attendees? Speaking to our Zoom attendees, if you'd like to make a public comment, please use the raise hand icon. Mayor Harvey, that'll end public comment. Thank you so much for that. Then I would be looking um, for a motion on this item. Um, I'm happy to make a motion uh, to approve the resolution authorizing the city manager to execute an MOU with the city of Browner Park to coordinate animal licensing services. Second. I have a motion second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And abstentions? Not hearing any, then that passes unanimously. And then I believe we will move on to the city manager's report. You're up, Damien. All right, thank you, Mayor, members of the council. So I'll try to keep this short. I, I wrote a long essay for tonight, um, but I'll just hit on the high points so I don't bore everyone to death. Um, so last time I reported on the DEA drug take back event, that was in October, that was October 28th um, here in the community center. And just reporting back that we received 18 pounds of um, pills. So it seems like a lot of pills to me, but um, it's good. It gets them out of landfills and gets them out of the uh, wastewater. So it's a good, they're good events and we hold those periodically. Um, the holiday toy drive is starting up. So that's a, that's a joint um, partnership between the city, Rancho Adobe, um, Fire District, Sonoma State PD, or yeah, Sonoma State University PD. And then the Rotary of the Roner, Roner Park Katati Club. And um, <clears throat> so through this program, we donate hundreds of toys, gifts, and gift cards to, um, to needy kids in this area. And um, donations are um, focused on primarily uh, the age group seven, uh, age seven up, seven plus, so seven through teenage years. Those are, those are the 
people that primarily ap apply and request um, gifts. And donations are accepted through December 25th at the police department or any one of the Rancho Adobe fire stations. For assistance, um, if people want to, um, you know, if you, have, if you have a family that needs um, or wants to participate in the program and have toys delivered to them, applications are um, at the police department or any Rancho Adobe fire station um, between Saturday, November 25th and Wednesday, December 6th. So that's the time period where you, have, where you apply. And then um, gifts will be wrapped December 10th and um, Santa will make deliveries on December 16th. So Santa rides in the back of fire engines and police vehicles um, and delivers toys for kids in this area. And then um, just a reminder that the Sunflower Park um, community survey is still up through the end of November. We had a, a first community meeting on um, Saturday, November 4th. That was to look at the 2019 concept for the park. And um, the community there, the people that attended actually really loved the concept from 2019. So it's um, going to be probably very looking very much like that original concept when we get to the, the final. There will be one more community meeting um, where we refine that concept further. That'll probably be in January or February. And then um, Putnam and Keter Parks. So we had the 29 cap, 20, uh, 2019 capital plan, which was the product of several community workshops. We held two community workshops recently um, for each park and also ran a public survey to gain even more additional feedback. And so we, the plan right now is to, um, is to bring, actually we ran a couple surveys, but the plan now is to bring that um, concept, that unified concept plan for both parks to council on December 12th. And people that, um, people that expressed interest came to meetings, we'll notify them of course at the meeting so they can come see what has happened with all the different comments and how we um, tried to uh, meld it all to hopefully come up with a plan that everyone, or at least almost everyone loves. You know, um, Redwood Drive, Cypress Avenue paving reconstruction, pavement reconstruction project. So that's, um, that's currently out to bid. Just so you know, that's gonna be coming to council December 12th. Um, Cypress Avenue sewer rehabilitation is also out to bid, um, also planned to come to council December 12th um, to get those repairs done ahead of the paving for obvious reasons. Um, we're also planning to advertise the wayfinding signs this week. So um, in the budget, we had the, uh, we did the kiosks already. Those are around town. Um, this next uh, stage was the, uh, the small entry signs. So all the various entries to the city so it's like a two post, um, welcome to Katati type sign. So it's not the big monuments, not the main entry, big round mounted monuments, but the, all the post mounted ones. So that's, um, that's gonna be advertised for, bid this, for bids this week. It's 11 entry signs throughout the city. Um, <clears throat> we already, uh, uh, just to let you know that the uh, countryside mobile um, home park conversation and actually more broadly, the, uh, the uh, mobile home park conversation for um, a senior overlay happened um, at the planning commission, November 6th. And we plan to um, bring it to council on November 28th for initial consideration. So that's coming up as well. Um, Santero way plan update. We had a scoping meeting at that same actually planning commission meeting on, on November 6th. This is uh, the scope of the EIR for that plan update. And we're taking comments on the scope of the plan through November 22nd. Um, this is the scope of the EIR for the plan. And separately, we're still um, taking applications for the community advisory committee and the application is available on the, on the city's webpage under the community development section. And applications for this close on November 27th. And um, we also have a community engagement um, survey that's going on right now, as well as door-to-door -door canvassing. That's going to start soon. Um, separately, we're also working on um, a lease with the company that's uh, working as the plan consultant for that, for the depot building during the term of the plan update. So it's a convenient location for anyone in the plan area to come in and during business hours and um, provide comments to the consultant. Um, and then um, we also have the uh, citywide community, talking about surveys, we have 
many surveys going out, going all the time, it seems these days. So we have also have the survey, the citywide um, polling survey with FM3 that we had talked about in council a couple of meetings ago at the ad hoc and looked at, and then um, that survey is launched now. So you might be starting to hear some things about it. Um, the um, active transportation plan, this is the, formerly known as the bike and ped master plan, but now it includes anything else other than bikes and peds. So that is, um, uh, it was reviewed, it was reviewed. Um, the Planning Commission also reviewed that on November 6th. And um, we're planning to take the um, project goals and strategies to uh, Planning Commission on December 4th. That's a Planning Commission meeting on December 4th. And then it's gonna be um, continuing to move forward and um, we'll be hearing a lot more about it early next year. So it's moving quickly. It's being fast-tracked as I think we talked about with SCTA and their consultants. Um, just so you know, also to Flayhaven Estates, it's one of the developments that's listed on our um, projects and process page. It's one of the housing developments on Old Redwood Highway by Clothier or, you know, by Hunter's Ridge area. That is also on, it's, it's scheduled to be on the Planning Commission meeting for um, December 4th. And so that'll be coming to the council in the not too distant future as well. And, um, um, I promise I'll wrap it up here shortly. So um, Candyland, which was, it was a huge, is our fourth annual one. And it was huge. Our city boat booth saw over 1400 people throughout the day. And we had 50 different businesses and groups participating, which is um, huge compared to the, you know, it grows every year. So it was, um, it was great and really successful. Um, the Sandy Loam Scarecrow contest is happening now. And there, um, I think the, the voting's happening now. So if anyone has any opinions about the scarecrows out there, now's your time to vote. Um, next week, we're doing our Thanksgiving break camp and we have a few spaces left. And this is 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Wednesday for families that um, need childcare for their kids while they're still working that week. And um, we're also doing a couple camps for winter break between the end of December and early January. December 1st is our annual um, holiday tree lighting in the Plaza Park from 4 to 8 p.m. And um, I won't go through all the details on that. I think everyone knows what it is, but um, it's going to be very similar to prior years, but it should be super fun. Um, December 2nd, the following um, day is the downtown is planned to be the downtown shop and stroll event. So that's also um, that's when Old Redwood Highway gets blocked off between basically Spankies and the Red uh, uh, Super Burger. And um, that's 11 to 5, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then December 9th is our breakfast with Santa, but I'm just teasing everyone because it's already sold out. It sold out a long time ago, but that's anyway, that's happening as well too. So a lot of things happening. Um, end of the year is always a big push for lots of events. That's it, I promise. I, but I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Yeah, um, I, I wanted to ask about the, so you talked about the the way planning like the smaller ones. When are the big Chief Katati ones gonna change? Uh, well, there's only, um, I believe there's only one that was recently up at West Sierra. Um, that one I think might be gone or if it's not, it'll be gone shortly. That's the only one remaining. Um, but we're gonna come in with new monuments that are like in the wayfinding program, they're completely different design. Okay, but but those are soon or after the other in, ones? In, in this budget year is only the, um, the smaller post-mounted signs around the city. And um, we'll have to talk about it next year during a strategic planning when we start doing the monument, like the big, basically where the main roads come into Katadi and you have the big like ground mounted signs. When we um, do those and what order we do them in. So we'll have, to, we'll have a conversation probably in strategic planning, I, I assume. Okay, thank you. And then um, I just, I heard you say community advisory committee, but I didn't hear what it was in reference to. Is that the Santero Way or is there something else? Santero Way specific okay. plan update, yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Damien. Then uh, I guess I, we will move on to city council member reports. Okay, I'll start this way. Oh, I don't have anything to report from the last meeting to this next one. All right, Laura. 
You know, I attended the uh, Water Advisory Committee meeting last Monday. Um, just a few highlights. The 2022-2023 uh, water deliveries came in 21% under budget. And um, right now, quarter one of this fiscal year, we're slightly over budget, but the model they use is predicting we might be 5% under budget for the whole year. Um, the new budget will be um, working its way through and coming to uh, city councils in March to look at. Uh, they reported, Don Seymour reported that because of the new forecast informed reservoir operations where they're doing more extensive rainfall forecasts and are being allowed um, to hold more water in the reservoir. Um, right now it's at the highest carryover at Lake Sonoma since the construction of the reservoir. So they're actually able to, to store substantially more water now thanks to that. And um, David Rabbit mentioned that um, we've been sharing, our <laughs> folks have been sharing those, they're called FIRO, Forecast Informed Reservoir Operations with other agencies around the country. And so we're sort of a model and other, other cities are starting to look at that and use that in their reservoirs. There's going to be, um, the, the letter that, that uh, was discussed at the last city council meeting was um, a, the, the similar letter that the WAC was sending through was uh, approved uh, and, and went forward. I did bring up your concerns about ecological health and, and trying to in, in the future emphasize that rather than just narrowly focusing on um, fish ladders, but rather the whole ecological health of the system. So I, I brought those comments forward. Um, PG&E is going to release a draft. I, I'm not sure if it came out yet. I'm not sure if Craig knows, but they're going to uh, release a draft this month of their decommissioning proposal. Um, and it's going to include the proposal that, um, that the water agency had put forward to them to participate in a new facility to continue the diversion through Potter Valley, through, for, through Potter Val the Potter Valley um, tunnel. Uh, and there's gonna be a 30 day public comment period. So I'm gonna be keeping my eyes open and checking on that. Um, they're going to have that comment period before they submit it to FERC. Um, there's going to be a Zoom, a meeting in Ukiah on December 7th that will have a Zoom option where they will hear from the broader Eel River um, community. Um, they're going to highlight what PG&E PG is going to include in their surrender application. And they're going to talk about the two different main contenders for the design of the new facility. And so that is going to be open, I think, for people to participate via Zoom. I'm going to try to zoom into that if I can. And um, I think that's all I had to say. Thank you. Did I miss anything? I was just going to say it's it's um, supposed to come out tomorrow. We'll we'll see. Okay, great. <laughs> That's timely. Ben, do you? Um, Sonoma Clean Power has reached its uh, strategic reserves goal about six months ahead of its ten-year goal for <laughs> for reaching that reserves target, which means that the the board has decisions to make about now that. Um, you know, if we just continue revenue as we have been, we'd be accruing, accumulating more money than than we need to meet that target. So, the board decided to um, use the bulk of that money for uh, reducing and smoothing bill shocks for customers. So, reducing bills even more below the PG&E baseline that we uh, Sonoma Clean Power historically has typically been about five percent, three to five percent below so PG&E. Um, hopefully, we can. Do even better than that in the future, um, but also <clears throat> it's uh, the board decided to use some of that potential funding to support uh, more local investments in uh, renewable and carbon neutral or carbon negative uh, power generation. So that program, especially programs that that uh, benefit communities that have traditionally been harmed by the power industry and by power generation, things like that. So thanks to good good program we're moving forward on. Great, Sylvia. 
Um, yes. Yeah, so last month, I forgot to report I went to the Economic Development Board Fall Economic Perspective. Uh, the keynote was Dr. William Rogers from the Institute of, uh, for Economic Equity. He's also with the Federal Reserve Bank. And the takeaway from there is an acronym called ALICE, A-L-I-C-E, which is uh, Asset Limited Income Constrained and Employed Community Members, which make up like 36 36 percent in Sonoma County. Um, so mainly the conversation was discussion of removing barriers because then there's more economic um, growth in the community when you help remove barriers in that community. Uh, November 2nd, uh, Sonoma Clean Power by Zoom, I listened in. Um, November 3rd, I went to a Parks Foundation meeting. November 9th, I did go to the Mayor's and Council Members Legislative Update with Mike McGuire. And um, some of the discussion included um, ACA 1, ACA 13, and there was questions from the different cities around um, um, the income-based chain charges, the energy rate increases, the Potter Valley surrender application. There was questions about um, homeless um, housing and the care courts that are coming. So there's some meetings coming up on that as well. And also city centers have brought up concerns about infrastructure improvements and modernizing, um, that there's not money in what the state can do to kind of help cities uh, with aging infrastructure. Um, and also there was a, a discussion for future discussion on the sales tax cap and whether that can be increased uh, because there's you know some cities that have a high tax rate like we do here. Um, so that was a discussion. And then I went to the uh, Katari Chamber of commerce, and they wanted to remind everyone that December 7th is a chamber crawl, uh, which is like an early bird happy hour, and it starts at flagship tap room um, on December 7th. So um, that's all that I have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I guess I'm last. So on uh, October 30th, I got to go over to um, the city of Sonoma, where the uh, Department of Water Resources presented uh, the three groundwater basins with their big giant checks. So I, I was <laughs> I have a picture of me holding our our uh, five point three million dollar uh, check for the Santa Rosa uh, Plain GSA, and then um, David Rabbit had the Petaluma Valley GSA, and they got six point seven million and Sonoma Valley got uh, 3 million. So it was great. And uh, the Water Resources Board is very happy with all the work that we've done and, and a lot of the things that we're doing um, are being looked at and used um, by other areas. So we're kind of a model there, but that was wonderful. And I don't know what they did with the check, but you know, Supervisor Gorner and I talked about, well, maybe we could go to Hawaii, but you know, they were just big paper checks. So that wasn't very useful. Um, on the 31st, I actually spent a couple hours down in the park um, for Halloween. It was great to see all the kids and, and see all the people. There was uh, great participation. It, it was nice. It seemed like they right after school, the parents came with all their kids, and it was great to see the, the creativeness in, uh, in their costume. I actually took a picture of one um, for my daughter because she tends to be one of these and it was uh, the woman had come up with a costume for a helicopter mom and it was really very cute and I said oh here's here's what you need <laughs> um, so uh, she'll kill me for that but that's all right um, then on November 1st um, I was uh, attended the LAFCO meeting and that was really a study session there is a group that is um, trying to form a water district up in the area of Alexander Valley. And they want to form this because they want to participate and be part of whatever happens with um, Potter Valley and all that. So um, we listened to what they had to say and kind of gave them some feedback and we'll see where they take that, whether they will actually come back to form a water district or not. We had some concerns in particular about the makeup of the board that they wanted. It, it appeared as if it was going to be these big landowners that were gonna really be you know, on the board. And, and we told them that we were concerned about you know, smaller property owners and, and that they contribute on that. So we'll see where that goes, but it was kind of a study session. Um, on the 8th, I um, tended the um, Maroon Sonoma Mosquito and Vector Control. There wasn't a lot on the agenda except um, 
they have gone all year um, doing Zoom and um, a lot of the board members, since it's Marin and Sonoma, a lot of them live in Marin and it's a large board. Um, so um, getting a quorum up here sometimes is difficult. And so they, needless to say, like to do Zoom. So there was a lot of discussion about that and everybody kept trying to bring up ways, you know, well, how could we, you know, work around, you know, the Brown Act and, and the quorums and all that. And, you know, every, every avenue that was looked at, the uh, attorney kept saying, well, no, that won't work. And, you know, for this, you need this amount of quorum. And for, so um, we're going to try um, having a couple of satellite um, you know, one in Marin and, and one up here in Katati. Um, the only downside to that is if there's not a quorum of folks at one of the two locations, if someone wants to use that exemption, um, you know, the, the illness or fam they can't do it unless there's, um, I think it was, there had to be like eight people in one location. So um, we'll see how that works. Going to give it a try, but that would that took us an hour and a half to get through that discussion. So that was um, interesting and fun. And then yesterday, um, I attended the SCTR CPA uh, meeting, and Damian talked about the active uh, transportation stuff that that we're working on. Um, they mentioned that they will be working with our staffs on um, what the programs there are to offer with Bayren. So I'm sure that you'll be looking forward to listening to what programs um, are available um, to everyone. And we had our new executive director that was his first meeting. So James Cameron is now the executive director. So so that went went well and he's happy to be there. And it was a pretty relatively quick meeting. And that's all I have. Uh, so the next item is public comment on non-action agenda items. Yeah. It's okay. Welcome. We didn't leave. No, you didn't. <laughs> You're here. So my name is John Ryder. I'm the branch manager of the Runner Park Kentucky Library. Um, that's why I wanted to come to the city council meeting and introduce myself since I work for her in the library that, you know, in name and hopefully in more future action serves her as well as Runner Park, even though we are physically located in Runner Park. Um, you know, I, I don't know how many of you have library cards or regularly use the library. I know they get close to the library, which is not our lab. Council, <laughs> council members, they um, But the library, so I'm, I'm here to mostly just offer, like, I would love ideas from the community of how we can serve you better with the resources that we have right now. Um, building a library, it's out of my purview, like that's something that our um, library director and administration is, you know, they're, we're looking at how to expand physical services into your community. So, but what I can do as a manager is I can try to offer ways I can use my existing staff and existing resources to better serve the um, Things we do right now with our new bibliobus um, that we've had for a couple of years, we regularly visit uh, Charles Street Village. Um, we visit them once a month. We don't see a lot of people there, but they are. We are also expanding bibliobus visits um, to Katani as well as other underserved areas in Sonoma County, like there's a boat. Um, and we also, you know, our staff do try to um, be present and table at major events in Katani. Um, I've been to Katani Kids Day twice, um, which was which was great. And then uh, this year we went to um, the accordion festival. Um, and we, we spoke to probably like a thousand people combined at both these events. And I know a lot of them traveled from outside, but we were glad to be present there. Um, you know, we also have a very active lab that has a that has a few Katani members. Um, but really, like what I'm here to do is just to you know say hi, introduce myself, and ask what more can I do for you. I have a couple ideas. Um, a couple ideas that I have for 
Um, you know, the library could work with the city, work with your um, parks and rec departments to maybe have regular library programs here. We have a regular program. 30 seconds. Okay, of big presenters that perform all libraries. How can we incorporate Katani into that? I think you say Another idea is uh, we do story walks in the library. We rotate them around the community. That's something that we can bring to Katani as well. So, some ideas I have, but I'm um, just going to try it. And this was all done. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. I hope Bibliobus items have a longer checkout than the normal 21 days since uh, they don't come back for another month. Well, we don't charge fines. No, I get that. But a lot of people yeah. that's won't do it if the. That's a good question. I, I think there's still three week checkouts, but um, they don't, those books can't be put on hold. So they automatically. I see. So you could have them up to nine weeks without any sort of. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, so I know we, we've talked about this as well as, um, so the Biblio bus going to a, a private residence at like one thirty on a Thursday is just really not serving, you know, the kids who are, you know, school kids or even, um, elderly folks who might not live there who might want to use it. So I, you know, would hope that we could increase them maybe in the plaza or maybe, you know, somewhere more central where people who don't live there would feel comfortable to come like after school hours or on a weekend. Thank you. And thank you for coming, Jen. Can we check with our Zoom attendees, please? Thank you, Mayor Harvey. Please use the raise hand icon to make a public comment. Lori, you have the floor. Um, I didn't raise my hand. <laughs> oh, your nope. hand's up, Lori. Oh, well, I, I'm lowering the hand. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you for your comments. Mayor Harvey, that'll end public comment. Okay. Um, then we will move on to information received after the agenda was posted. Kevin, did you want to address that? Uh, yes, there were uh, two public comments received regarding item. I did post those on the agenda packet and confirmed um, during one of the public comments that they are there. Although I did hear from city staff members that they are not able to view them. So I'm not sure what's going on with that, but um, I will be speaking with our new agenda management platform. Um, and I apologize to the public um, that those were not available, um, apparently, although I thought that they were, and I'm looking at them on my computer right now. Um, but they were uh, provided to the council here in print and uh, are available for the public as well in the chamber tonight. Maybe you have special privileges. That's probably what it is. <laughs> All right, so with that, um, I will call this meeting adjourned at 8.02. Thank you everyone for attending.